All right, good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? Last uh, seminar of the week here at Magic. Good for you guys. Round of applause for everybody to show up. That's awesome. I was, I was not sure if everybody would be hitting the dusty trail and heading home or, or what, but this is awesome. A great variety of um, speakers this week, and I'm excited to be closing the program. So a little bit about me, who I am. You know, I appreciate you all coming out to support me. I'm sure not many of you know exactly who I am, but I come to you with about 20 years of retail experience. I owned a brick and mortar store in southwest Wisconsin, very rural community, farm community for many years. Uh, now I currently work for a company called The Boutique Hub. Who's heard of The Boutique Hub in here? Woohoo! I see some hubbies. That's awesome. So I'm the director of partnerships and education for The Boutique Hub, and we have Ed Olvera right down here. He is our director of wholesale. He works primarily with the brands. Yes, and he needs a round of applause, right? Yeah, Ed. We like Ed. Everybody likes Ed. So what is the Boutique Hub? The Boutique Hub is, we say it's a three-sided marketplace. It is a co collaboration of boutique owners, brands, and service providers, all in one spot. To collectively work together, collaborate, network, bring each other together through education and tips and tricks. Basically, as a small independent retailer, it is a way for you to have a voice and a connection to the industry 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Whether you're laying in bed at night, going through our, our closed social media channels, interacting with members from across the country, or you're here at Market in a meetup like we had last night right down here, filled a beautiful, beautiful room with amazing boutique owners. We had a trend talk from Kelly Helfman here from Magic, and a lot of really awesome educational tips, things like that that we do throughout the year, those fun events, pop-ups. We do market meetups at all the majors, but really our primary focus is to provide you with education. Things that help se separate you from the rest of the retailers out there trying to own it, win it on their own. But yet they're sitting there thinking, okay, it's getting to the middle of February. I need to be starting to think about Valentine's. Nope. That was a while ago, right? But why are they doing that? Because they're so busy in the grind that all of a sudden they look up one day and said, oh my gosh, it's Valentine's next week. And then they pull up their Facebook and they see a cover photo of a Christmas tree. They're like, ah, missed that one. We'll do better on the next one, right? So we do a lot of collaboration. We do a lot of tips. We're all the time sending out market information, marketing information, things to help you be in the know, things to help you be ahead of the game, right? We're almost, we're like a coach. We are helping you see the forest through the trees. So that's what we do at the Boutique Hub. I primarily teach retail boot camp, boutique owner basics. We do the best of the year challenges. I help um, bring in service providers, uh, such as like Management One, who here works with somebody like Management One. Lightspeed Retail, Springboard. Um, we work with uh, photographers. We work with, like I said, inventory planners, buyers, LA buyers. We work with all sorts of different services that can help you build your business versus saying, okay, I need a new point of sale. I'm gonna look it up on Google. Let's see what Google has to say. Now, what you're gonna do if you're a Boutique Hub member is you're going to go to our service provider directory, find a long laundry list of vetted services. You're gonna check them out, offer, many of them offer a great discount for you. But then the beauty of the community is you're going to put a post in one of our Facebook groups and say, hey guys, looking for a new point of sale system. I have Shopify for e-commerce, what do y'all use? And within minutes, you're gonna have all these other boutiques that give you tips and tricks and things to look out for, things that have worked. Anyway, that's the beauty of the boutique hub. So that's what we do. So taking that a step further, like I mentioned, our education. We know that you guys are in this business for many, many reasons. Some of you are in this business because you have a passion for fashion. Some of you are in this business because you just like pretty things, right? Whatever it is, I guarantee you there's some people in here that, but there's very few people in here that went into a small business because they like to manage a team and they like to manage bookkeeping. Who here has a love of people managing people, not serving people, like selling people things to them, but you wanted to be a boss and manage people that showed up late, wanted to leave early, and didn't ever want to work on weekends or holidays? <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah, me neither. Who here went into owning a boutique because you love running numbers. No. <laughs> Not me neither. But you guys, these are some of the non-negotiable things. When Sandy asked me to come speak, I've got to be honest. 
Sandy was the first person at Magic that I uh, talked to many, many years ago, and I'm going to say it's probably 2008, the first time I came to Magic. A little backstory: I worked in my store as an OJT student, which means I'd leave school at noon, I'd go to work at this boutique downtown, you know, I got to unpack boxes, I got to vacuum and dust, I never got to do the window. That was not part of my gig. <clears throat> I earned my way up into that, but anyway, so I worked in an OJT student, right, in the, that role. I didn't really have a voice, but I learned a lot along the way. Later on, I came back from college, and the lady that owned the store at the time, she always said, Sarah, one day you're going to own this place. So I came back from college, and I'd work on the weekends, or I'd work, you know, in the summers, or whatever it was, whenever I was available. And I always kept thinking, I wonder why she doesn't do this. I wonder why the carpet still smells like it did when I was a little girl shopping in here with my mom. I wonder why the, the ceiling tiles, those all awful false ceiling tiles, they used to be white, I swear they were, now they're gray. I wonder why she doesn't replace those. I wonder why, I wonder why, right? Well, I didn't ever ask until I finally came back. I, I was coaching down south at Oklahoma. I was, used to coach at a university. And mother of two kids, we needed to get back home to Wisconsin. And so I moved back, bought the store, well, probably, bought, walked back into the store, same carpet, same smell, same everything. And the girl that owned it at the time, I said, why don't, why don't you remodel? Why don't you give this a facelift? She said, oh, I can't afford it. I said, okay. I said, uh, how about we get the internet? And she's like, this was in 2005. And she said, the internet? I don't know, I, I, no, we're not gonna do that. There's no reason to do that. And here I was, living all over the world, and I'm thinking, have you not gotten out of this store since 1992, 93, you know, when we both worked there in high school together. And she looked at me, she kind of was just a little put off by it, but what, you know, I was like, okay, just offering a suggestion. And there was a lot of different things that she was doing that she'd always done. We're not gonna fix it because we've always done it this way. And we're unpacking boxes, and one day I had this conversation with her, and I said, you know, it's a big wide world out there. And it's going pretty fast. People are emailing, people are building websites, and she's like, oh, we just, we can't do that, we can't do that. But anyway, fast forward. I ended up buying the business in 2007. We got the internet, we started traveling to markets, started emailing vendors, that was very effective. <laughs> anyway, we really started to grow. And I realized real fast that there was a lot of things a business owner just didn't have time to do because they were so busy spinning their wheels trying to stay ahead of the game, right? Now back then, there wasn't something like the Boutique Hub. And honestly, she had never been to a major market like this where there was a group of awesome boutique owners, business owners, in one area, one setting. You guys could turn to the neighbor next to you and say, how's business for you? What are the vendors that you're killing it with? What's the biggest mistake you've made? You know why they didn't do that either? It's because it's all about competition. All right, who can agree with that? Like a lot of times, people don't like to give up their, their secret sauce. Well, Fast forward to 2020. If we don't start collaborating together and work together, we're gonna to get overrun by the big dogs. And you know, the big word is Amazon. So what do we have to do? We have to collectively grow together, build resources, have them at the tips of our fingers, have that knowledge base, have a team that can help us bring us to that next level. So I say all that to tell you that I'm extremely transparent. Since 1993, through coaching in college, running the retail store, now finding myself at the hub, I can tell you I've coached so many different boutique owners along the way, and one reason people continue to want to ask and talk to me and come back to me is I'm super vulnerable and honest about all the stupid stuff I did. All the disasters that I created, you know, all the, the pride that I had in my business, right? All the mistakes I made. So when Sandy asked me to come and speak, I, I kind of chuckled because like I said, she was the very first person I ran into at Magic many, many years ago. When I decided I was gonna get on a plane and leave rural Wisconsin and fly to Vegas and source out new items for my little bitty hometown store, I shouldn't say little bitty, it was 4,000 square foot basically department store in our, in our town. It was big, it served a wide variety of customers, um, but at the same time we shopped one regional market and we went there twice a year. It's a lot different now, right? So I, says, I made a call with, with Sandy, and I said, Sandy, I'm gonna need a tour, because when I get, I get there, I wanna know what I'm doing, I wanna get the lay of the land, 
I want to use my time wisely, right? So I met Sandy. I mean, a wild, spitfire lady. She still is today. God bless her. And then when she called me this fall and asked me, Sarah, would you like to come speak? I thought, holy smokes. Look at the way God works, right? So here we are. Me, this is me telling you some of the things I've done over the years and some of the things that I see so many other boutique owners do that gets us in a bind that honestly we laugh because we think that boutique owner back in 2005 that was running a business without the internet, a lot of us are in the same position today. We're running a business without efficient tools and a, and a mindset for growth. So let's get into this. Five non-negotiable elements of running a successful retail business. One, time management. I know this sounds like something you've all heard about, but it is, in all honesty, the key to productivity because like I said, so often I see boutique owners doing things and I talk them through processes and they are starting an item or they're starting a project but they're not finishing it. Or they're doing something but they're not doing it very efficiently. And next thing you know, they might come in at 8 o'clock in the morning, but it's 11 and they have not accomplished anything. So, stop spinning your wheels. Get it done right the first time. Build a business rather than a hobby. We know growth is going to be hard. It's going to be bumpy, right? A lot of people hear me say, you know, those people, those boutique owners that, you know, they're walking around magic. You see them. You've seen them on social, whatever it is. And you're like, holy smokes, that's who I want to be. They're on top of the mountain, right? Well, they didn't get there. They didn't land there. They climbed up that mountain just like you're climbing up the mountain today. And they fell and backlogged and they kept on trucking and here, there they are, right? But do they all stay there? No, they don't. 24 hours in a day. Does anybody in this room have more than that? No. That's fixed. That's never going to change. The, the lady that I used to work for back in 1993, same 24 hours, right? That lady that you see, the girl, the young girl walking around, the influencer, the boutique owner that you think is killing it, she has the same 24 hours. Rachel Hollis has the same 24 hours. We all do. It's all we're going to get. It's what we do with that, right? So I hear a lot of times people say, I don't have enough time to do my books. I don't have to, we don't have time for a team meeting. Well, do you have time to sweep your sidewalk? Do you have, I mean, this is a real thing. Who owns a brick and mortar store? Do you have time to get the dead flies out of the window? Yeah, you do, because it looks awful, right? Well, you, got, you have to make time for all these things, and all that stuff has to fit in 24 hours. And hopefully you get time to eat, sleep, hopefully exercise, spend time with family, friends, people you love, people that fill your bucket, right? So, non-negotiable, be efficient with your time. One little task that I challenge you guys to do, and it's very elementary. I'm not standing up here as a rocket science. I, I'm telling you this is extremely elementary stuff. Take a 24-hour window, time block, and write out all the stuff that you want to do. And put them in order. What is most important to you? Is it couch time with your kids? You know? Is it book work? Is it buying new inventory? Is it scrolling on Instagram? You know, be very mindful of how much time we spend sitting there flipping through that. And if you can block that out and just kind of take an assessment of that, it's just a really good, you know, put you in your place really fast. Who iPhones? It tells you how much screen time you have, right? You know, what do you do when you look at that and all of a sudden you're like, yikes, that's a lot, right? Do we do anything about it? Do something about it. Make sure your time is managed properly. Ultimately, we say this all the time at the Boutique Hub, we want to make sure you're running a, bo a, a business, a boutique business, not a hobby. So this is when it gets really tough. A self-check. Do we pay ourselves? I'm not going to ask you guys to raise your hands. But from my, from my coaching experience, I know it's not very many of y'all in this room that consistently pay themselves. Do you feel confident in your business right now as you are sitting here and your business is happening back home, wherever it is, do you feel confident in what's happening? When you woke up this morning, did you jump into your analytics? Did you take a look at things? Are you looking at your store video camera to see what your staff's doing? You know, how, how comfortable do you feel being gone? Are you paying your bills on time? 
That phone, when it rings, does it make you cringe? Do you feel comfortable about it? Did you come to market with an investing plan? That investing plan is really important, guys. You notice I'm not saying buying plan. Did any of you guys come to market to buy and that's it? Or did y'all come to invest in, a, in an item that you're gonna take back and sell at a profit? What are we doing? Are we investing in items for a higher return or are we, are we the end of the buying cycle? We're investing. Gotta have that mindset that we're investing, right? Do you have your inventory broken up into classifications? I say this fits under the time management schedule because I, this is extremely important. If we don't have our inventory broken up in classifications, how do we know what to go and invest in, right? If we didn't come to market with an investment plan, how do we know where we should go? How do we know how we're gonna spend that eight hours that we're at market? Or are we just aimlessly gonna walk around and be like, ooh, that's cute, and ooh, that's really cute? I, I say that because, guys, that was me. Sorry, that was me. Going back up here to do you pay yourself. Like I said, I'm very transparent. When I realized that I was not running a business, it was a really, really scary day for me. It was tax time. I got my, my taxes back. You know, I had to go have my husband sign these. And uh, I'd been, oh man, I'd been pretty prideful. I had not been very honest with him. I make all sorts of excuses. And those of you that are in the hub, you always hear us say, you cannot deposit excuses. That doesn't happen. So he's sitting there watching the game and I thought that was prime time, just slide the old tax return in there and he was just gonna sign it and hand it back, right? And he did, he signed it, but then he kept it. And I couldn't very well jump in his lap and grab it back out of there. So I sat there for a second and just hoped that something awesome was gonna happen in the game and he was gonna hand me tax return back, but that did not. So break in the action happens and all of a sudden he does this. Now, my husband is a financial planner. He is an in, uh, investor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does risk management. Oh. Now keep in mind, I've been in business for quite a while. We did not have very much communication about this, did we? He saw me taking pictures on social. He saw me going off to Vegas. He saw people in town be like, I just love your story. You do such a nice job. We were in the paper. We got awards in the community. Da 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 da. Life was awesome. Right? I mean, is anybody in here on board with me on this or am I like the only fish in the sea? Right. So he does this. He looks at it, silent. And I am just sweating. <laughs> And then he looks up at me, ugh. And I still can feel that in my bones, right? And he's like, what the is going on? And I'm like, oh honey, well, I just think it's best that we reinvest everything back into <coughs> business and we gotta spend money to make money and the whole deal. And he just said, this is your thing. You're very smart. You have an MBA. I'm going to trust you to figure this out. And I'm going to support you. And I'm going to help you. Because next year this is going to look different. I'm like, whew. Yes, it is. Yes, sir, it is. It sure is. You bet. Let's see you later. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was just like, what are you doing, Sarah? What was I doing? I was coming out here. I was going to Lion King. I was going to O. I was eating steak. I was, I was living my life. I was jumping on Fashion Go every other morning. You know, I was like, oh, okay, shoot. That looks really bad. Our sales rack's over half of our store. Hmm. Maybe we should open a second location because we have so much inventory. No. Guys, that was a, a true just come to Jesus moment to me. Like, get your act together. Right? So, I decided it all started with paying myself. You guys might think at that point, you're like, seriously, you didn't have enough money to be paying your bills, right? But you're going to pay yourself? Absolutely. Because nobody else was showing up earlier than I was. Nobody else was staying later. Nobody else was answering the tough questions. Nobody else's name was on any of those line of credits or the branch or anything like that. Nobody else was going to, I was, nobody else was going to answer to my husband. That was going to be me. 
Mm. Yeah. So I decided if I'm going to do all that, I'm going to pay myself. Because I know me and I know what I'm motivated by. And I put, I, I started out with 300 bucks a month. Not a big deal. Who, you know, who cares? Right? But it was. It was $300 I wasn't going to go spend on Fashion Go or $300 I wasn't going to spend on a show ticket in Vegas. I was making sure I took care of myself first. Knowing I still had all this other stuff I had to do, right? But at the end of the day, I would walk into my store a little bit happier, you know, a little bit more confident, a little bit more like, you know what, honey, actually here's, I, I, there's $300 check I just put in our bank account. I know it's not much, but that's, I'm contributing. I am contributing. These are baby steps. So self-check for yourself. Whatever it is, you own it. You earn it. Reward yourself, right? It'll change your mindset. I promise you it will. That first $300 sale I'd make every month, I mean, I'd go in the back room and do a happy dance. I'm like, yeah, I just earned my paycheck. I mean, I had girls that were making, you know, back then they were making 10 bucks an hour. I, that was a big time. And I'm like, this stinks. They're making so much more than I am. And they're the ones, you know, complaining all the time. But whatever, that's a whole different topic. But nonetheless, pay yourself. Non-negotiable, guys. Non-negotiable. Yeah. You wouldn't show up for anybody else and work as hard as you do without getting a paycheck, right? You'd walk real fast. All right. Building a team. I talked about this a little bit. Was my husband on my team? Yes. He was on my team when I started communicating with him. He was really on my team when, as a silent person in the background. He just didn't know how bad of a team he was on. Right? You can't do it on your own. So I want to talk about actual employees. Who has employees? Who has stress when it comes to employees? Right? Who doesn't have employees because of the stress that you have? <laughs> right? I know I can get it. All right. I'm going to put this in sports terms because I'm a sports buff. As a, as a coach, you are the communi communicator, you're the mentor, you're the leader, and you're the listener, right? When you hire somebody on, it's important, it's imperative that you bring them up to speed on what is happening, what your goals are, what your expectations are, all these kind of things. And I say these things, and please don't just erase them like, I oh, no big deal, I already know this. Do we know it, and are we doing it? Because I'll be very honest, I would hire people and I'd, I'd have them fill out the paperwork, and I'd be like, all right, there you go. Yep, there's a couple of customers. Just go wait on them. Oh, yeah, point of sale system. Yep, I'll walk you through that. All this stuff. But I would never actually help them understand why are we doing this the way we're doing this? Why is it so important that those flies are not in my store window, right? Because if those flies are there, the customers don't want to come in. It doesn't care how many beautiful products we have inside the store, but if the front of the store looks bad, if there's weeds growing up through the sidewalk, whatever it is, they're not coming in. Or they've already, they've already got an idea in the head of what we're selling, what we do in there, right? <coughs> I'm a big believer in training, testing, reviewing, and repeating, the TTRR. I preach about this in Retail Boot Camp. I work with this in depth in all my coaching, whether it's basketball or rodeo, whatever I coach. TTRR, you cannot just teach somebody to do something once. Basketball fans in here. Anybody? Anybody play? Anybody else have the luxury of coaching fourth grade girls basketball? Ever? Those girls in fourth grade, third grade, whatever it is, teaching them to do a layup? Taught them one time, did I forget about it? No. Those girls now are in varsity. What do we start every practice with? Layups every time. Your kids, or your employees that you brought into your, into your store, taught them how to do a return on time, first of December, then you got busy, then you left for Christmas, whatever it was, that poor girl sent in there on December 26th, and in walks that customer, right? The customer that wants the return, the customer that wants everything. And you got that poor young girl that tra you trained one time, 30 days ago, on a return, Trying to keep her happy, trying to keep you happy, trying to understand the point of sale system, trying to make sure she's doing all this stuff right. And she is sweating bullets, right? And you're like, well, I trained you. No. The thing is, that girl, the fourth grade girl, I gave her a basketball, intended her to put the purple, or I'm sorry, not purple, the orange basketball through the hoop. 
For what? A clap? A good job? Yet we teach that fourth grade girl to do layups over and over and over and over again. That girl that we just entrusted with hundreds of thousands of dollars of our inventory, in our name, in our brand, in our business, we taught her how to do a return one time. And now we're gone. Now we're sitting here in Vegas, and we hope that she knows what she's doing. It doesn't make any sense, but we do it. Why do we do it? It goes back to the first part, because time, we aren't, we're not managing our time right. We've not implemented a process that everybody goes through, a system, right? And I'm not, I'm by no means shaming you guys. I'm just telling you, these are things that I did and I learned from. Taking a step further, communication with your team, as that's non-negotiable. Train them, test them, review with them. Talk it through, right? Repeat it. And then when you guys are steaming and hanging merchandise in the back room or updating Facebook pages or covers or whatever it is you're doing with your team, walk on the warehouse floor, just talk to them. Just talk to them. What's on their mind? How do they feel about their team? How, how do they feel about their, their, their job right now? Taking a step further, what is the goal? Do you have a goal for each staff member? Again, the basketball team. Is that point guard's role the same as the forwards? Is that point guard's role, you know, what? she's carrying a lot of burden, right? She's got to bring the ball to the floor. She's got to break the press. She's got all, she's got to make the play. She's got to call the plays, right? We're setting her up in, for success in a different way. Have we talked her through that? She's feeling comfortable with that. Does she understand all of the roles that she's playing? When she's that fourth grade girl, I'm like, I want to bring the ball up the floor. You know, and you're like, really? That's a lot. It's a lot of pressure, right? Same as that girl that's going to work and she's going to be there on Black Friday, Small Business Saturday. You know, these are the things we're going to deal with. How about the day after Christmas with the returns, right? And all of a sudden, all the sales start. All that stuff, we have to communicate all those with them. I always talk about this, and, and this comes from The Great Game of Business. It's an amazing book, an amazing book, The Great Game of Business. It also talks about a basketball team and a coach is sending five kids out there and saying, all right, go win. That's it, what are we telling them? Go win, right? Just like we tell our, our customer or our staff, go make sales. We have got to make sales. If we don't sell stuff, we don't make money. If I don't make money, I can't pay you, right? Okay, it's so a basketball team. Go score. What's the first thing they're going to ask? Which basket are we going to? Right? Which basket are we going to? How much time's on the clock? All this kind of stuff. What's that other team that we're going up against? What do they do? They're going to have questions. I promise you, your staff has questions too. But sometimes we are not the boss that's approachable. Sometimes we're so busy that the staff doesn't feel comfortable that we can even come talk to us. I'm going to tell you a story about um, one of the, uh, a, a store owner that I was coaching, and she came to me and she said, I am so embarrassed. She said, you always talk about communication with my team, and she goes, I really dropped the ball this time. I said, well, okay, tell me about it. I said, I'm sure I've heard worse. And she said, I had this girl that's working for me, and she was doing really good. And all of a sudden, she comes in one day, and she said, I, I can't work here anymore. My parents won't let me work here anymore. And she said, your parents won't let you work here? Why? She was, they said, I can't afford to work here anymore. And I'm like, okay, immediately my mind is going, you're buying too much you know, merchandise. You're, not, you're, paying, you're spending your paycheck. And this lady's like, no, that's not the case. She was getting a parking ticket every time she came to work. And I went silent, just like, I'm like, what? And she said, yeah, I didn't tell her where to park. And by the time she, her shift started, our parking area was full. So I didn't tell her where to park. And she kept parking in different spots. It was getting a, a traffic violation ticket every time, parking ticket every time she'd come to work. And her parents found them in the glove box. And they were furious. <coughs> so a lot of us are like, well, why didn't she come to the boss and say, where should I park? I keep getting a parking ticket. Right? Well, put yourself in a 16-year-old body who's a little bit insecure, who just doesn't feel like they're fitting in, right? And the boss is going 1,000 miles an hour in every different direction. Next thing you know, two weeks of parking tickets add up. Your mom and dad say, uh-uh, nope. So, 
this is, I, I hope that story resonates with you because there, you have your own stories that are like that, right? So do you have a goal for them from the start? Are you communicating with them what their expectations are from day one, right? Or are we hiring people and be like, oh, you know what, I really, yes, I think you're going to do a great job. And, oh, you don't want to work Fridays? Okay, that's probably okay. And, oh, you don't really care to work holidays or weekends aren't your thing? Okay, we'll work around it. We're flexible. We're flexible. It's kind of like the kiss of death from an owner to a to staff because what we're flexible on our end means we'll talk about it when it comes up, but you are going to have to work some of these roles. We're flexible to a 16-year-old is like, oh yeah, mom, dad, I don't have to work nights or weekends or holidays. Right? So we got to watch that. Get, going a step further is do they have expectations for you? Are we open and honest and, and forthright with what they can expect from us, right? Can they hold us accountable? Again, these are non-negotiable things that honestly, it takes time to implement in the beginning, but you're gonna be so much further ahead as it goes on. Communication. Does your staff enjoy their job? How do you know they do? When was the last time you asked them? Are they in the right seat at the table? Are they doing the right job for them? Right? God has blessed us all with different gifts. I firmly believe that. Mine is not graphic arts. You set me in front of Canva and you will find me still sitting there six hours later. I don't, that's not the way my mind works. I don't, that's not my God given gift, right? But if Ashley Alderson, the founder of the Boutique Hub, had me do graphics, she would sh very quickly realize that's not the best use of her time or her money, right? So, are they challenged? How do you know? When did you ask them? Who wants to be in a dead-end job? Does anybody inspire to be in a dead-end job? No. no. Your staff doesn't either. Breaking up. We've all been in relationships, right? It's easy to do with somebody who doesn't care. Do you care about your staff? Do they know you care about them? How do you know they know? To just say, oh yeah, I, they know I care. They know I care. No. How do you know? Think about it yourselves. When was the last, what was the last time you, or last job y'all had before you decided to be your own boss, your own boutique owner? I guarantee you, if we were to take a poll, the majority of you guys left that job because of the management. Or you left it because of the team, you left it because it wasn't fulfilling, you left it because you weren't challenged. So why would somebody leave you? All the exact same things. Again, going back, you can't do this on your own. You are going to need help. The bigger you get, the bigger your problems, right? So you're going to have to surround yourself with a team. But you got to take care of that team. I'm not saying you have to be best friends with them. There's definitely a line of respect there, right? But gosh, it's a different world than it used to be. The grass is always green on the other side of the fence. It's so easy to believe, right? You're inspired and by everything on social media. It's so easy to just get inspired by something else. If you feel like you have a home, you have a, somebody's got your back, you have a, an, the ability to succeed and go above and beyond and excel and have a voice in your current role, that's awesome. Odds are you're going to stay. Don't fear them taking over your job. Who here does not want anybody to take over the job? Right? Okay. I have a little bit of a rebuttal on that. Train them to be able to manage things as if you were gone all the time, right? You want them to be mini means. You want them to be you, don't you? Or do you want them to be sitting behind the cash register right now playing solitaire on their iPhone? <laughs> They're not ever going to take over your job. Is that what we really want? Again, I am not by any means schooling anybody. I'm just saying I did this. I, I remember hiring somebody. She was awesome. She's a rock star. And all of a sudden, I'm pumping the brakes. And I'm like, ooh, I think I'm giving Katie too much authority. I think Katie might take my job. I think Katie might, all this stuff. And all of a sudden, I'm like, Sarah, focus on what you're doing. If I spend all my day worrying about Katie, Katie's over there killing it. You're right. Katie's going to take over my job. Is Katie going to come in as a 22-year-old, right out of college kid, and be the 45-year-old me? No, she's not. She doesn't know all this stuff. She hasn't sat there and sweated through the hard stuff. She's not sweated through the stuff you guys are doing, right? I just, I beg you, it is better to train leaders than it is leavers. Give them the tools to win. Help them feel successful. They will want to stay. It's not negotiable. Train them to grow 
or watch him go. That's a great book. Who's read it? Train him to go or train him to grow or watch him go. It's so easy to go again. It's so easy to go to the next place. It's so easy to jump fence in everything we do, every relationship we have. And honestly, the majority of that stuff comes back to communication. All right. Dun, dun, dun. Bookkeeping. Ah, oh, man. I, I, right? Nobody raised their hands earlier when they were talking about the passion of bookkeeping. Well, true recipe for success is getting familiar with your numbers, not negotiable. Who has a date with your numbers every week? Nice. I like it. Awesome. I'd love to see 20 times that many hands in the air, but that's awesome. Good job, you guys. Not negotiable. A date with your numbers every week. To be in the know with your at the it's to assess the health of your business. Failing to manage your numbers is like failing to weed a garden. Who gardens in here? Or who's seen a garden? Right? Y'all have seen a garden. Who's seen a really nice one? Takes time. Takes dedication. Who has seen the overgrown gardens of late summer? I mean, everybody put those in with big expectations and they were gonna get a great harvest and they were gonna feed their family and they were gonna do all this kind of stuff. It was gonna be amazing, right? And then all of a sudden, the weeds started coming and they got busy. They're gonna do it next week, right? And then the next week, when those weeds came even faster, the ground got harder harder to pull those weeds out. Well, now I'm going to wait for a rain. I'm going to wait till it gets a little easier, and then I'm going to weed that garden. The next thing you know, your fruit is rotting on the vine because you can't get to it, right? Or the fruit's not growing because it's getting, you know, it, it's not getting the sun or the nutrients, all these kind of things. It's being taken over by the weeds. I give you that analogy because that is what happens in our businesses with our bookkeeping, right? We've got to start somewhere, and we've got to maintain it. We've got to be consistent with it. We've got to know what's coming in, what's going out. We've got to know about our inventory. We've got to take an assessment of our payroll, right? Are these in healthy checks with our business? What's coming into our business? Taxes, all that kind of stuff. We teach a whole lot, a whole another course on bookkeeping. It is a monster. I'm not standing up here saying it's easy and just go do it. By no means. However, it's not negotiable. We have got to get a system, right? Being unorganized now will lead to extra time and expenses later. I've coached a lot of stores that do all their bookkeeping 100% on their own, and then come tax time, it is a disaster. And all of a sudden, in the month of December, they're so busy organizing that they're not selling, right? They're so busy trying to get their year-end stuff put together that they're not selling. And we all know what December means to us as retailers, right? We have to be present and focused, and we've got to be on our A game. We've got to move that inventory. We've got to bring in the numbers. We can't be like strangling ourselves back there trying to keep up the bookkeeping that we failed to do all year long. Who has a point of sale system? Who has a point of sale system other than Shopify? Okay, I only say that I don't know. I love Shopify. Shopify is a great e commerce platform. But Shopify's point of sale lacks a little bit when it comes to reporting. I'm a firm believer on the knowledge that you get from your numbers, right? And Shopify is really up in their game. They are, they're coming out with some brand new things that'll happen in another year. But there's also Delirious Profit, there's um, uh, Inventory Planner, Shop Inventory. there's some different apps, add-ons that you can get into your existing Shopify point of sale that will help you. But what I'm saying is, when you look for a point of sale system, make sure it's, it's communicated with your bookkeeping system, which I'm a big QuickBooks fan. I'm a big QuickBooks fan because I think it's, there's a ton of tutorials about it. You can always find out how to do what you're asking to do, right? There's the online as well as the desktop. But also your point of sale system, you wanna make sure it communicates with that bookkeeping and your e-commerce platform. This is gonna help you reduce the data entry so you're not inputting everything into a point of sale, exporting it, then putting it into a bookkeeping system, and then pulling your e-commerce numbers. That's just kind of a nightmare. There's a lot of room for error, right? So look for that. But a point of sale system is so much more than the cash register. So much more than the cash register. It is gonna input your sales, right? Help you with your customer uh, retention, your customer management, what you have on order, all the stuff you're buying today. Go home. Put those purchase orders into your point of sale system. You can run a report and tell yourself, what do I have coming in in the next 30 days, in the next 60 days, the next 90 days? 
right? Because you're going to stay organized. You're going to use that point of sale system for what it can help you with. Are we doing too much discounts? Do we have room to do more discounts? Now again, back up to one of my first things I was talking about inventory classifications. All these things are very important to look at as a store as a whole, but you also want to look at that as shoes, denim, graphic tees, sweaters, skirts. <coughs> Excuse me. How old is our inventory? How about staff reporting? Who's killing it and who needs more training? What staff is constantly having returns come back on the sales they made? What staff is constantly voiding transactions? Little tip, that's usually where you can find some, some issues going on with your staff. Maybe some theft, maybe some loss right there in voided transactions. Purchase orders. How do you guys stay organized? There's apps, there's different things out there, but at the end of the day, your point of sale system, you want everything to go back into your point of sale system with all your purchase orders, right? So it can, at a click of a button, calculate how much money you have spent and how much money you have already contracted, right? So you can better plan your cash flow. If you're one of the ones that go home with, I did this, I had a whole suitcase full of purchase orders, right? And they'd go in my suitcase, They'd go into the back room when I got home, and I'd say, okay, um, we need to organize these. Maybe we'd alphabetize them. And then when UPS would show up, I'd say, okay, go pull that purchase order, receive the merchandise. How do we know we received it in the time that we were supposed to receive it? How do I know that when Sue comes in and says, gosh, Sarah, when are you going to get more of those jeans in? Or Sue when are you, says, when are you going to get more of those uh, size 10 in that shoe? Do you carry it? I'm like, well, yeah, I think I just ordered that. Do I go back through those stacks of papers, alphabetize and dig through and try to find that? Or if I did a good job with my point of sale system, I enter that purchase order in, I could pull up that style number and it can tell me, here's your window, your 30 day window of when this is gonna ship. Instantly Sue is, or Sally, whoever I said, I'm sorry, is very, very happy about it, right? <coughs> that customer retention tool, right? You wanna send out birthday coupons, right? You wanna send out anniversary coupons. Point of sale system, at a click of a button, you can do that. You are sitting on an excessive amount of extra smalls in your store. You just don't sell them. You can go pull up a report of all your customers that buy extra smalls. You can segment that list, send an email to them specifically. It says, we have da 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 and extra smalls. You know, send them some pictures, blah, blah, blah. That's awesome. How ticked off would your size 18 customer be if you got, she got that email? She doesn't want that email, right? That's not the call to action you want. What I'm saying is it's 2020. There are tools out there that'll help you be efficient in your business. Again, you only have the 24 hours in a day. Guys, before we, when I had this store, when I worked there in high school, we wrote orders with carbon paper. <laughs> Who even knows what that is? <laughs> All right, can you imagine? Yeah, no, I mean advance, right? All right, so. Are you building a business off of luck or skill? Be in the know. Make the best investments of time, money, and people. Again, 2020, use your resources. And like I say, you've gotta know your numbers, and if you are struggling with cash flow, I tip, look at your inventory. Look at how old your inventory is. Make sure your inventory is working for you, not against you. Because you can't spend inventory. You cannot spend inventory. You can only spend cash. If you're here at market and you're going crazy, making orders, right? And you don't have those classifications, you didn't have a plan, you get home and all of a sudden, you've lost that loving feeling of being at magic. You know, the, the vibe's gone and all of a sudden you're sitting back in your back room and now it's, let's say it's the 15th or <clears throat> the 16th of February and you're starting to think that all those bills that are due on the 20th and in walks your friend, the UPS man, with box after box after box. How do you feel about all that inventory now? Immediately you get stressed. This was me, right? Immediately I'd get stressed and I'd think, what was I doing? Why did I buy all that? Why? And then my manager, Katie, would come in and be like, um, Sarah, we're out of hangers. <laughs> uh, who's been there? We're out of hangers. No. So the first thing, I, 
the singer of old times would have done is like, all right, store supply warehouse, let's get some more hangers. We must need more hangers. No, we need to sell inventory. We need to sell the stuff that I already invested in. They got lazy and forgot to move, right? To make room for the stuff I got super excited about over here. So that's a whole nother, whole nother session, right? But if you're tight on your cash flow, look at your inventory. Bottom line, if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. You're just running a hobby. If you're not keeping up with the ins and the outs, cash flow wise, you don't really know your numbers. You don't really know your business. All right, we'll go through four pretty quick because I've, I've kind of touched on a number of it, but managing your inventory is key, to, or your energy is key to success. So true. Do what you do best and hire the rest. Everything you do should be income generating, right? And there are things here that you guys are doing that are 10, 8, 10, 9 dollar an hour jobs, right? When you should be doing the 100, 250 dollar an hour jobs because that's what you that's what you know, right? And that's your you have the ability to do those kind of things. Right? Is your time best spent? So you have a team of people, is your time best spent vacuuming? No, it's not. But sometimes we're, we just feel like we have to do it all, but that's what we do, right? And that's keeping us from doing the real income generating activities of restocking, knowing our bottom line, making, making payroll, right? So, so our staff's happy, all these kind of things. Having relationships with our vendors, calling and asking for extra days dating, or asking for a return, an RA number on a package that was shipped that didn't work for you, right? Those kind of things are the big guts of your business, right? Making the sales with that VIP customer that she wants you, right? Those kind of things. Stop avoiding the parts of your business that scare and drain your energy. Bookkeeping, if you are really not efficient in bookkeeping and you go into the back room and you dive into that reconciliation of your checking account, right? Or credit card statement or whatever it is and it instantly gets you mad, it's because you don't have a good relationship with those numbers. I get it. Like you just, you don't feel good about them. It's a stressful situation. So all of a sudden your energy starts to drain, right? And you're irritated and it starts to show on your face. It starts to show on your body language. And then all of a sudden in walks that poor little girl that wasn't sure where to park, right? And how do you treat her? Not very good. In walks that VIP customer that expects the, ult the, the ultimate treatment. And how do you treat her? It shows, right? So a lot of what you can do is figure out what you do best and then go out there and really surround yourself with somebody that wins at that. My best friend's a CPA. I don't know how we're best friends. She's a bridesmaid in my wedding, right? But she is a huge part of, she's a huge part of my team with my, business, my boutique. I really got to the point where I was like, all right, I'm relying on you. Where are my inefficiencies? What can I do better? Guide me. This is what I pay you for, right? Stop taking the, I, I stop with the guesswork. So your energy affects your team, your customers, and your bank account. Energy affects attitude. Your attitude is contagious. You either affect people or infect people. You know anytime you have a team, doesn't matter if we're sports, whatever it is, the one bad apple can ruin it, right? That's something else we learned in kindergarten. I always tell my team, my staff, if you're having a bad day, you either need to go back outside, take a breath of fresh air, whatever it is, go out and give somebody, go find three people, give three people different compliments, right? Because I swear that's the best way to get your attitude turned around. Compliment three people, and next thing you know, they smile at you, you smile back, life is starting to get a little better, right? But at the end of that all deal, if they can't turn their attitude around, it's best for them to leave. It's best for me to leave. Because I can't handle an energy crisis in my workplace. Right? We've all been there. We're going to have bad days. It's just part of it. And we can't let those bad days turn into five bad days every week. But you can't let that affect your business because I guarantee you it will trickle down to your customers, which affects your bank account, which affects the word of mouth within your community, within your business. So again, what type of leader are you? What would your staff say? Do they know your mission? Do they understand your goals? Are they home making assumptions about you right now? Right? Are they home like, she went to Nellie last night. 
two nights ago. She was at O last night. Man, she's getting to take all these awesome pictures with all these cool people. She's in Vegas just having a lot, lot, the time of her life, you know? And are they jealous back home? Or do they feel like, hey, you know what? I'm leaving you in charge. This is your baby. I'm so excited that I'm leaving you in charge of this while I'm gone. Because I couldn't do this without you, right? That's uplifting conversation. They feel like they are really winning it back home, right? And they feel like they want to succeed for you. Same with your family. Who has ever tried to go on a diet? <laughs> Who's tried to go on a diet by themselves and not told anybody I'm going on a diet? How successful is that? It's pretty hard when your kid comes on like, hey mom, let's go to the movies. Okay, yeah, let's go to the movies. And then they're like, here, you want some popcorn? Nope, mm -mm. nope. How come? I don't want popcorn. <laughs> I just don't want it. How about ice cream? No, not, no, I don't want ice cream. We always want ice cream. I don't want ice cream today. <laughs> Next thing you know, they're like, wow, this is a really fun mom and daughter day. Right? How about if I would have just been vulnerable and said, you know what, guys? I'm going on a diet. My goal is to lose 10 pounds, and I need y'all to support me in that. Maybe the conversation with my daughter that next day would have been, hey, you want to take the dog for a walk? That fills my bucket. That's helping me towards my goal, right? If you tell your staff that you guys are overbought in shoes and we need to move some of these shoes, and this was on me, I, I, I invested in too many shoes, and I cannot invest in any more tops until we clean out some of the shoe inventory, right? They might be much more interested in selling those shoes with every pair of pants or every outfit that they sell, right? To get you to where you need to be financially to make the goals, right? Instead of running on the back like, oh my gosh, Sarah, look at those pairs of shoes. I just saw these, you know, Ronnie Monkey just came out with these and we've got to have them. And the whole time you're just like, yeah, those are really cute shoes. All right, you guys all like those? Yeah, I like those. Okay, so you both buy those. So all of a sudden, yep, all right, all right, yeah, let's get the 12 pack pair of shoes and we've sold two. And all of a sudden, we're not helping our cause, right? But that's what we do. That's what we do. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. I think this is so important, especially with all the social media that we're all in, inundated with all the time. But know your customers and serve them to set your business apart from the rest of the industry. Your, per, your customers have got to be able to rely on you, not negotiable. They have got to be able to look to you and, and have confidence in you. And be, you want them to be loyal to you, right? You don't want them, you don't want to show up for them today and then show up six months from now as a completely different business, right? Right? You've got to stay in your lane. You've got to own who you are and what you're doing, right? Avoid spreading yourself too wide and too thin. What does that mean? If you've got that bulk customer that really relies on you and say you're the denim resource, that you, that's not very common, but when you find a store that is the denim resource and it has the body styles of jeans that fit you, right, you're going to them because we hate buying jeans, right? And then all of a sudden you come in there and that place you've always been able to buy jeans from, now all of a sudden, instead of them having five or six different sizes of jeans that are really working, now all of a sudden, they're only offering like one size across that one, but yet they have 25 styles of jeans of every other type of jean available, right? Because now they want to attract other customers. Well, now your core 20% of your customers that bring in 80% of your business feel like you've forgotten about them. Does that make sense? There's the 80-20 rule. 20% of your customers are probably bringing in 80% of your business. So why go after? Why, why just spread yourself too wide and too thin and spend all your resources trying to gain those other outside customers, right? 80% of your income's a lot. Love them. Treat them right, right? Avoid comparing yourself to everyone else. Get a support system to keep you on track. This is where my friend Shelly would come into play. This is where she'd see me doing things financially that she'd pump the brakes on, right? She was an unemotional set of eyes on my business unemotional set of eyes in my business. Who here has used somebody like inventory, or, uh, an inventory management planner, like RMSA or a management one? Management one is actually what they're called now. Anybody? That day that I had that moment with my husband, there was a couple things I said I was gonna do. I was gonna pay myself, and I was calling an inventory management planner because I was, 
out of control with my inventory. He would be able to, I'd, I'd send him five reports. These are really important. I would send him sales for the month. Now this is on classifications. So I bought, and we teach a ton about this, but just so you guys listen real quick. I'd break my inventory up in about 10 different classifications and I would send him sales, discounts, on order, what I had coming in on order for that classification, what I'd received that month for that classification, and then what, oh, what my overall inventory that I owned at that time was for that classification, right? I would send him these numbers and he would look at it and say, Sarah, you have so much money tied up in jeans. You need to clear out your jeans before we can do anything else. Your inventory turn is super, super low in jeans. We've got to feed the top category, right? We've got to clean up some money. We've got to make that happen because that's the, the classification that's funding your business. So he, on emotional set of eyes, he got me zeroed in on how to become more efficient, right? And where to make money instead of just spreading myself super wide and super thin. Very important, right? To be very honest, that guy one day, he's, he led me in on this one. He was like, so, so you're gonna take your kids on a vacation? And I was like, well, you know, John, you know I can't afford to go on a vacation. He's like, how come? And I'm like, well, I just, I can't, you know. But I gave him all these excuses, and finally he's like, you know what? Because you've got a, a car and a vacation hanging on hangers in your store in jeans. How do you like your vacation now? Go tell your kids, sorry kids, we can't go on vacation because of those eight racks right there. That's your vacation. <laughs> I, talk, I talk an awful lot about mindset. Get yourself in a mindset, and this is where this unemotional set of eyes helped me see this. Your inventory is $20 bills on every hanger in your store. It's not clothes, it's not cute, it's not fashionable. That's your money. That's a $20 bill, a $50 bill, hanging in your warehouse, hanging in your store. Wrap your head around that, and then you're gonna almost get a little bit greedy and be like, I want my money back. <laughs> I want that back in my pocket right now. So avoid these four common mistakes. Not staying true to your vision and mission, right? I challenge you, go home, ask your staff, ask your husband, ask your wife, do you know what the vision for my store is? See what they say. If they don't know, it's a great time to train, test, review, and repeat. Right? Avoid getting too big too fast. That whole silly, I would say stupid idea I had that I had so much inventory I should just have a second store. I didn't have my act together with the first one. Why would I go ahead and have another one? Getting too big too fast. Failing to set a date with your numbers, not negotiable. You've got to set a date with your numbers every week. Being prideful, it's okay to ask for help. Get that unemotional set of eyes on your business. Communicate. We have one mouth, two ears. Ask questions, listen. Your staff is a wealth of knowledge. They see things that you don't see, right? I talk about coaches. Who here watched the Super Bowl? Right? Not just the halftime show, but the actual game. <laughs> How many coaches do those teams come on the sidelines with? Right? And those guys are professional athletes. How many coaches are up in the skyboxes? So many unemotional set of eyes on what's going on. Well, some of them are very emotional. But what I'm saying is they can see the forest or the trees for the players that are out there in the rut. They can see everything happening from a different angle, right? They've got a better vision on what's happening depending on where they're at. And then you've got certain people that are focused 100% on the defense, 100% on the offense, right? 100% on their key little niches in the business. Because that's a business, right? Big time business. But yet those guys are professional athletes. We assume they know what they're doing. They have coaches. So should we. So, I know this is the end of magic, but you guys take a tour. Take a tour, take notes and take pictures. There's apps out there, like uh, I believe it's Faves and Market, uh, M2B is Market to Business. There's apps that can help you when, with your inventory investing. It can take pictures, you can download the information right there, give it a classification, a cost, a markup, all that kind of stuff into this app that you can later go back and be like, what did I buy today that was 
you know, plaid? Or what did I buy that was orange? Or what did I, you know, what all these kind of things. But if you don't have those, take notes and take pictures. Ask the right questions when you go into a booth space. I'm a big believer in walking into a booth space, you see something you like, please don't ask the vendor how much it costs. That comes later. Something I teach an awful lot is walk in there, ask them, when is that gonna be delivered? Does that fall into what you need? If he says it's gonna be shipped out tomorrow and you don't need it for two months, then walk away. There's, oh my gosh, there's so much other stuff out there. If he says, I can, I can ship that today or I can ship it in two months, when do you need it? Well, I need it in two months, okay? Touch it, feel it, ask about the size, ask about the fit, ask questions about it. Ask yourself first, what can I sell that for? Right? Say this green blouse. I look at it and I think I can get 70 bucks for that. Perfect. I know I can sell that to 70 bucks for my customer. After I've asked all these questions, that's when you turn the price tag around and you look at it. To find out if it's a good investment. Do not fall in love with that product too early. Because I promise what a lot of you guys have done is, because I did it, you'll look and be like, oh man, I bet I can only sell it for 50. It's, it's wholesale's 39, but oh my gosh, it's so cute. What a waste of time. We don't have time for that kind of thing. We want a bigger return on investment, right? And you, there is row upon row of resources out there. Ask the right questions. Don't fall in love too early, right? Keep track of your purchases. Fill the classifications that you need filling. Avoid the classifications that need cut. Right? Communicate, communicate, communicate. I'm big on analogies, and I did this for somebody the other day that asked me this question. So, about the deliveries and why that's so important. I'm a Wisconsin girl, we drink a lot of milk, right? So I'm gonna go to the grocery store and I'm gonna buy myself a gallon of milk for my family, right? And I'm gonna say, okay, we, we, need, we need milk often. But do I need five gallons of milk today for a family of four? No. What if I make an investment mistake and all of a sudden I, I don't ask the right question when that gallon, those other gallons of milk are coming and I take home the one gallon of milk I need and then next thing I know, UPS driver brings in four or five more gallons of milk tomorrow. And there they are. Well, you said you wanted them. You didn't communicate and tell me you didn't need them for two months. So here they are. I, yeah, I already have your credit card. Sorry to build you. What's milk? How long is that going to last? Right? So when you think of your inventory like that, it has a life cycle. And it's got to work for you. You cannot deposit in the in inventory. Right? You cannot spend it. That's a mindset. I talked an awful lot about that in our weekly boot camp. But anyway, what is your vision? Connect with the right customers. Go after that. Continue to go after that 20% that's bringing you the 80. Build your brand. Build that list. Raise your voice, be relevant, right? Make sure you're saving money. Make sure you're making money. We wanna grow. That's the vision of the Boutique Hub. That's a vision for you guys. Those are some key components. This is who we are. We have a style side, we have a business side. We teach retail boot camp course, like I said. We uh, also we host the big Boutique Summit every year. We have a boutique planner that we launched this year that is absolutely fantastic. I'm gonna jump off the stage here real quick. I'm gonna show you guys this. I meant to bring you this up stage. But uh, this right here, anybody in here have one of these? Man, I designed this with my friend Jesse Jarvis. It has all the market dates, it has reminders, it has tips for you months in advance, right? In June.